his relationship with his parents. The Queen and Prince Albert looking regal, the Prince with an admonishing finger towards his heir apparent. Victoria looking out to the world, not looking at her family at all, in regal serenity. Edward carried an extraordinary burden of expectation. Victoria announced the birth of her son and heir to a relation by saying, He is to be called Albert, and Edward is to be his second name. You will understand how fervent my prayers are to see him resemble his angelic, dearest father in every... She and Albert certainly had a very passionate marriage. That in some way explains her relationship, perhaps with her children. Sometimes the children of lovers are orphans. That's what happened to the royal children. They were somewhat excluded from the bond between their parents. Edward's isolation was increased by his parents' other mutual passion, the family business. These twin deaths pushed close together like that symbolize absolutely the royal firm, the king, the king and queen as a partnership, as a ruling partnership. Victoria's death with her pictures on it, with all her uh, writing implements, the, the knobs to call the servants, Albert's death with his blotter, his inkstand. And they pushed their desks together and would work side by side on papers of state, on royal dispatches. For Victoria, hard work offered protection from her dark side, which she feared she had inherited from her wicked uncles. That's what she called her predecessors, the Hanoverians. Victoria believed her uncle's excesses had almost ruined the monarchy's prestige. With Albert's help, she set out to repair that damage. Central to the plan was Albert Edward, known as Bertie. From the age of seven, he was subjected to a grueling academic program designed to suppress Hanoverian style self-indulgence. The study regime that Albert prepared for his son uh, began at about six hours a day of tutorial study. Uh, gradually, it was extended to about eight hours a day. Edward was slow to learn, slow to read, uh, slow to write. He wasn't very good in mathematics. He wasn't very good in reading. Uh, he wasn't very good in history. He was a terrible his history scholar. Uh, and his father was appalled. Edward probably had uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, which meant that he was impulsive, that he, he was inattentive, uh, he was in need of constant physical activity. The boy rebelled. His tutor described how once Bertie had thrown dirt and swung a large stick at me. Another time, when the prince was 11, uh, he went to the window, stared out the window, and eventually when he was asked to come back to his desk, his father had to thrash him for that. Because of his willfulness, his stubbornness, his... Uh, ...sad and anxious about him. He is so idle and weak. It was one thing to say that he ought to be an example to his future subjects, but to say that he should be exactly like his father was too demanding. And the parents therefore left him with a sort of perpetual sense of failure. A rare break from this misery came in 1855. The 14-year-old Prince of Wales went with his parents on a state visit to the court of the Emperor and Empress of France. Now, they were exactly the kind of people that suited the temperament of the young Prince of Wales, was unlike his own parents, they lived for pleasure, they loved clothes, they loved excitement, they loved balls, they loved dances. This simply set his, his pulses racing. And he was clearly gobsmacked, to use a modern phrase, by the sort of wonderful um, uh, vivacity and, uh, and lack of pomp and circumstance, and of course all these gorgeous women. There they all were in their ball gowns, you know, bowing to him, and to a 14-year-old boy, what more do you want? The imperial couple made a tremendous fuss of the teenager. Edward's response revealed the depths of his unhappiness. When they were about to leave, Edward told Napoleon, you have a very nice country, 
I wish you were my father. And he wanted to stay in France. And the emperor said, oh, you can't stay here. They need you back home. Home, for much of Edward's childhood, was Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. It was meant to be a holiday home, but there was no let up in the character building regime. At Osborne, the playground was an allotment. And the idea of uh, Victoria and Albert for the children with these gardens was to make them productive, was to make them work hard and systematically. It was a regulated childhood and they grew vegetables and vegetables were checked and if they were of sufficiently high quality, they were actually sold to the house. So in a sense, make them part of the domestic economy and make them very responsible citizens from a very early age. His high-minded parents despaired of the teenage Edward. Looking ahead, Victoria fretted about what would happen when the young prince was old enough to do as he wanted. Bertie continues such an anxiety. I tremble at the thought of when he will be of age and we can't hold him. It is too awful a contemplation. In 1860, Edward's parents took a gamble. Hoping to confront him with the awesome... They made him stand in for the Queen on an historic three-month tour of staunchly Republican America. He was just 18 when he became the first British royal to visit the United States. He was a very important person, uh, literally a VIP, as we would use the term now. At almost every stop, there was a ball in his honor. He even went to the White House and was greeted by uh, President Buchanan, and he learned how to handle this with grace. Edward lapped up the applause, on one occasion exclaiming in delight, this for me, all for me. Nourished by the warm reception, a new Edward blossomed. His geniality shone through, and people talked about him constantly as the genial prince. The trip was a tremendous success. Uh, it was a success for British foreign policy. It was a triumph. Edward had learned that for a royal, smiling and being charming were just as useful as desk work, the last thing his parents wanted him to discover. Letters were written home by the minister who was with him and that sort of thing, saying what a splendid success he'd been. And Prince Albert simply refused to believe it. And he wrote him a rather disagreeable letter, saying that it, he mustn't allow his success to go to his head. The American tour was a great success. I mean, he was an absolute celebrity. Um, all his best side was shown. I mean, his sociability, his diplomacy, um, all that came out. He really made a great success of it. I mean, he was a very young man when he went, but his parents didn't appreciate that. They didn't congratulate him on it. And it was another example, I think, of them wanting him to be something else, something that he never was and never would be. On his return, Edward was told to reapply himself to the doomed attempt to be like his father. He was now to become an intellectual. In 1861, he went up to Cambridge University. But unlike other students, he didn't take rooms in college. Instead, he was installed here at Maddingley Hall and closely watched by hand-picked guardians. When we realize that Mattingly Hall is four miles from the campus of the university, we understand something uh, of why he was here. Uh, the royal family did not want him with undergraduates. Uh, they didn't want him too close to the uh, decadent gentlemen who were students at Cambridge. But Edward invited some fellow students to Mattingly. Among them was Nathaniel Rothschild, who wrote I have received an invitation to dine at the lodge on the 28th to meet the Prince of Wales. The Prince is kept very strict and cannot even ask anyone to Mattingly. He is very fond of riddles and strong cigars. If he followed the bent of his own inclination, it strikes me he would take to gambling and certainly keep away from the law lectures he is obliged to go to now. Rothschild was perceptive. When the Prince found ways of giving his miners the slip, the real Edward emerged. The temper tantrums of his uh, younger days were over. 
uh, he was learning how to enjoy himself. With his friends, he spent most of his time at play. They went out hunting, they went to the races, they played cards late into the night. He was at his heart's desire when he was with students who filled the rooms with cigar smoke. At university, Edward learned little that his parents approved of, but he did develop a gargantuan appetite for sensual pleasure. He needed as much as he could get in of gratification, you know, whether it was food or smoking these huge cigars or the excitement that was generated by gambling. Whatever it was, it had to be now. It had to be fulfilling and it had to make up for the empty space that was left behind from the sort of childhood that was not really a childhood at all. Cambridge would provide the backdrop to the greatest crisis of the prince's life, all because of a practical joke by some of Edward's raucous new friends. They contrived to get a young lady of what I think is called easy virtue, called Nelly Clifton, to get into his bedroom one night uh, and to stay the night with him. He was delighted by Nelly Clifton, and uh, apparently everybody knew that Nelly was now a mistress of his. Albert found out and was appalled. I write to you with a heavy heart on a subject which has caused me the deepest pain. I having to address my son as one who has sunk into vice and debauchery. Victoria, don't forget, and of course um, her husband Albert too, were very anxious about her mad, dissolute uncles. Anything that suggested a sort of throwback to their dissolute ways appalled them. Edward, after all, was the heir to the throne, and he had to live um, a life which was exemplary as a sort of a monarch to be respected, not a monarch of license and carnival. Both parents overreacted, deeply concerned, and decided that he must pay a visit to the Prince of Wales at Cambridge. Albert was in no condition to make this journey. Albert at this point was a sick man. He was very likely dying of cancer. We know from the symptoms that he uh, expressed in his diaries and in his letters uh, that he knew that he had something inoperable and that he didn't have long to live. Not wishing to be overheard, Albert took Edward on a long walk to lecture him about what he called the evil deed. The weather was poor. It was cold, it was November. Albert almost certainly caught pneumonia. He took to his bed as soon as he got back to Windsor, uh, and in two weeks he was dead. On the 23rd of December, 1861, Prince Albert was buried in the chapel at Windsor. Victoria was absolutely distraught with grief. She really felt that her life was over. She'd seen the monarchy very much by that time as a partnership. She had not only lost an emotional partner, her helpmeet, but she'd almost so lost her sort of business partner, her working partner. And at that time, she didn't seem to take very much comfort in her children. The regretful prince wrote to a Cambridge friend about his late father, admitting, I fear I have often given him pain by my conduct. By the time he wrote this letter, Edward had already dropped out of university. He knew that the most happy time of his life was over, that he would never be able to retrieve those years. He would have liked to have stayed longer, but he now felt that he had to take his father's place to be the leading male member of the royal family. But Edward was in for a shock. The Queen attributed Albert's death, I mean, totally irrationally and unjustly, to the Prince of Wales. And she wrote a letter to her daughter, Vicky, uh, after Prince Albert had died at the end of 1861. And she said in this letter, it was Bertie's fall, that's what she referred to the incident with Nelly Clifton as, Bertie's fall killed his father. And then she said, it's rather awful, that... Oh, that boy. 
I never can or shall look at him without a shudder. You've killed your father. I mean, a dreadful thing to tell a child, isn't it? And uh, he carried the burden of patricide for the rest of his life. Queen Victoria mourned her dead husband, Prince Albert, with the same single-minded passion that she had loved him. Here at Osborne, there's a painting of Albert, painted, in fact, in the year of his death, 1861. And if we cross to the other side of the fireplace, there is a marble bust of Albert, and over there, there's another portrait of Albert sitting, looking relaxed. There was an important matter of state or a family matter which concerned her. She would actually go and consult with the bust of Albert. You know, Albert, in a sense, presence was everywhere for Victoria. He may have been dead, but Victoria continued Albert's improvement scheme for their son and heir. My firm resolve, my irrevocable decision, is that his wishes, his plans about everything, are to be my law. I apply this particularly as regards our children, Bertie, etc., for whose future he had traced everything so carefully. Albert had believed that marriage offered the only hope of salvation for his wayward son. So Victoria now searched for a bride and a future queen. The act of succession made it necessary that he have a Protestant bride, and the bride had to be within certain age range, and she also had to be attractive. Uh, pictures were solicited from various courts. Edward's elder sister, Vicky, had recently married Prince Frederick of Prussia. So she was well placed to trawl the Protestant courts of Northern Europe for a suitable bride. She sent her mother photos and descriptions of the leading candidates. I do not think the Princess of Hesse very pretty. She had not a fine figure, and her teeth are nearly spoiled. Princess of Viet is so odd. She talks so much and laughs so loud. Eventually, a winner was found. I never set eyes on a sweeter creature than Princess Alex. She is very healthy. This was Alexandra of Denmark. Alexandra was very young. She was 17 at most when they first targeted her, possibly even 16. She was one of the most beautiful girls in Europe, and they thought that that would perhaps be sufficient to make her attractive to the Prince of Wales. And so they decided that they must get on with it and, and, and that she was the wife for him. Edward was dispatched to the continent. Left alone with his mail order bride, he did his duty and proposed. And it's difficult to say quite how passionately he fell in love with her at the time, but I think perhaps fell more in love with him than he with her. She once said that even if he'd been a cowboy, uh, she would have wanted to marry him. Edward married Alexandra on the 23rd of April, 1863. He was 21. But the blessing of the young couple felt less like a wedding, more like a funeral, all thanks to Victoria. In this wonderful photograph, instead of looking with pride at her son and his new bride and smiling benevolently, she's actually turned away and looking at a bust of her late husband. It was a very dismal business, and she made it even more dismal by taking the bride and groom before the marriage uh, to the mausoleum where Albert was, uh, uh, was buried. She's saying, this is the father that would have been there to bless you, and this is the father that is always there is the father to whom you have to live up. It is a, a, a most poignant picture. Marriage did have advantages for Edward. Notably, a home of his own. Well, this is Marlborough House in London, and this was his marital home. He moved in here in 1863, just after he married Princess Alexandra. You can see how living in a place like this uh, must have reinforced the idea that Edward always had of his status as a prince.
Independence liberated Edward's natural instincts, which his parents have tried so hard to suppress. He and Alexandra held parties every night, and few would refuse an invitation from the Prince of Wales. Soon, Edward and his smart friends were known as the Marlborough House Set. He needed people, he needed social input, and he needed all the excitement and love and attention that uh, one gets when life is just one long party. Victoria was not amused. She felt that Alexandra was not very clever and had not acted as the sobering influence which she had hoped for. I fear Bertie and Alex will be nothing but two puppets running about for show. From the royal stables. There she was wheeling around, looking very pretty, I'm sure. Sir Charles wasn't expected back for days. But fishing in Norway was very bad that year. It had been a heat wave, and most of the fish had been already caught. The salmon had been already caught, so he decided he'd come home to see his lovely wife. He was missing her. Sir Charles was outraged. The prince beat a retreat, leaving the irate husband to vent his anger. Afterwards, he gave orders for the ponies to be brought out. And uh, Lady Mordaunt was brought down onto the... And then the following year, Lady Mordaunt gave birth to a baby here at Walton Hall. Then she became very agitated, and uh, Sir Charles kept asking her what was the matter, what's wrong. And eventually she told him very foolishly. She said that she thought that the child was not his, and that one of several men could have been the father. And among those she, she mentioned was the Prince of Wales himself. Sir Charles Mordaunt wanted a divorce. Edward now faced public disgrace as an adulterer. The only ray of hope was that Harriet appeared to be going mad. This made her confession of adultery suspect. And under Victorian law, an insane person could not be divorced. But Sir Charles was stubborn. He intended to prove in court his wife was sane. The trial would hinge on Harriet's confession of adultery. Edward took the stand, the first heir to appear in a court of law for almost 500 years. He came into the witness box and was asked flatly whether he had or had not committed an act of impropriety with Lady Mordaunt, to which he replied, no, he did not, <laughs> had not. The court then heard from Dr. William Gull, Edward's personal physician, who said that in his expert opinion, Harriet was insane. On the testimony of a prince and the diagnosis of an eminent doctor, Harriet was declared mentally unfit. She spent the rest of her life in an asylum, her claims of adultery dismissed as fantasy. Edward had got away with it. He has the opportunity because of his very specially elevated status to be above the normal sins that ordinary people uh, get stuck with. And he learned it, and he learned that it was useful to him uh, to have that status. By the time he turned 30, Edward's relationship with Princess Alexandra was a marriage in name only. And for the rest of his life, he would enjoy a string of exotic affairs. There was Lily Langtree, a model turned actress. Cora Pearl, a famous courtesan. Lady Daisy Brooke, whom he called my darling Daisy wife. Any Prince of Wales, um, he can simply, the, 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 the opportunities are absolutely endless. And once women realized what he was like, um, he in a way became fair game for any kind of adventurers. At house parties, he would sleep with a woman for one night. He might Prince Albert had helped with her workload and even had his own key to the boxes. When Edward asked for one, Victoria replied, You could not well have a government key, which only ministers and those immediately connected with them or with me have. The prince was impulsive, and his impulsiveness led him into indiscretion. And she realized that to give him any access to information was wrong. 
uh, because he could not contain it. And she wanted to keep in full control, and so she was very, very reluctant to let him see government dispatches or any Foreign Office documents or anything like that. In many ways, she fueled the fire of um, Edward's rather unemployed youth style of life because he wasn't seen to have a role in it. It must have been very frustrating and somewhat humiliating. Dismissed as worthless and irresponsible, Edward sought distraction in the social whirl. And as Prince of Wales, there were plenty of people willing to amuse him. Christopher Sykes is a descendant of a leading member of Edward's Marlborough House set. It's rather lucky that great-great-uncle Christopher left us this fantastic legacy in the form of these wonderful photograph albums, which really chart his, his social life. Well, there is Christopher Sykes. Oh, he's enormously tall. That's the Prince of Wales looking very young with a jaunty bowler hat. I mean, the Prince Edward was a pleasure seeker. His social life was sort of endless round. A Goodwood house here, this would have been for the races. This is a shooting party at Eastwell, Wadston, the Rothschild's house. Lord Londonderry's house, famous for its enormous shoot. Prince Edward would like to shoot thousands of birds. Christopher became known for being one of the great hosts, you know, and you knew exactly how to please the prince, and each party would be more and more lavish. As well as exploiting their hospitality, Edward found that he could vent his frustrations on his hangers-on. At some dinner party at Marlborough House, the prince poured a glass of brandy over Christopher, and Christopher just sat there with the brandy trickling down his face, and then sort of very slowly turned to the prince and just his head and said, as your royal highness pleases. Now that caused absolute sort of uproar amongst all the other guests, but it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. And from that moment onwards, there was sort of no holds barred as far as teasing Christopher was concerned. You know, they used to sort of put him under the dining room table and spear him with billiard cues. And they put live animals in his bed. Well, he was a bit of a bully, Edward. He enjoyed ha having the power over people. Christopher Sykes' friendship with the prince ended up costing him more than his self-respect. They went bankrupt, unfortunately, and they just blew every penny he had. He died sort of penniless. Very well, rather sad, really. Poor Bertie gives much cause for remarks of no good-natured kind. He is more and more careless. No one looks up to him. Victoria feared that Edward's lifestyle was damaging the image of the monarchy, but her own behavior wasn't helping either. There was a lot of Republican agitation, the idea that the Queen uh, was invisible, uh, having continued her mourning. The government was paying a lot of money to maintain a monarchy, and she was not there. She would not open Parliament. She would not appear in public in almost any way. Edward, meanwhile, was more and more rumored to be involved in uh, what amounted to uh, problems. The popularity of the monarchy was sinking until fate and bad drains intervened. Bertie, in December of uh, 1870, caught typhoid. And this really was a turning point. The Queen rushed to Sandringham, where, where he was. She took complete charge of the household. She was a killer. The plight of the royal family touched a nerve. The invisible queen and her playboy heir became just a terrified mother and her dying son. Edward's timing was perfect. His illness reached its climax on the same day of the year his father had died. on the morning of December the 14th, he suddenly opened his eyes, saw the Queen, and said, how very kind it is of you to come and see me. Two months later, Edward, still weak from his illness, went to St. Paul's Cathedral to publicly give thanks for his recovery. Thousands came to watch and cheer. 
totally by accident, the Prince of Wales had pulled up British Republicanism by its feeble roots. The result was a feeling of great relief around the country that the succession had been saved, that uh, Albert Edward was going to survive and become king. And uh, it was also thought that because he had come through this near-death experience, that he would be renewed, he'd be a different person, uh, that he would understand that he had a new chance at making a dignified life for himself. If this great warning is not taken, and the wonderful sympathy and devotion of the whole nation does not make a change in him, it will be worse than before, and his utter ruin. For once, Victoria followed her own advice. She gave her son a job. In 1875, he was sent to India on the first royal visit since the mutiny. There was no chance that his mother was ever going to go to India. In fact, I don't think she ever visited any of her dependencies around the world anywhere. It was a means of associating him with, you know, to use a, a much used metaphor, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, and to show that he could go abroad as a representative, not just of his country, but of his family and the institution that they represented. And it certainly was very good for his own public relations. Edward had been persuaded to visit India by the prospect of the hunting. And along the way, he did manage to bag eight tigers. But amidst the carnage, the prince's personality, above all his easygoing charm, served him well. He enjoyed himself, but he also represented the crown, and he did so with flair, with dignity, uh, with great ceremony. He was a tremendous envoy, ambassador extraordinary. It was a complete success. But any pride Edward might have felt was ruined when he read in the Calcutta Times that back home, his mother had been created. He now saw his hunting trip had a secret agenda, to test public reaction to the Queen in the wake of the mutiny. And no one had told him. The Prince wrote home complaining, as the Queen's eldest son, I think I have some right to feel annoyed. Adding, I should have received some intimation of the subject from the Prime Minister. Fearful humiliation to see the future king of this country dragged, and for the second time, through the dirt in a court of justice. A terrible humiliation. Edward was furious. He felt Gordon Cumming had no right to wash his dirty linen in public, and so risked damaging the reputation of a royal prince. He called the trial unnecessary and abominable. Barrister Peter Clark is a descendant of Gordon Cummings' lawyer and has made a study of the Tranby Croft case. The opening day of the trial, the court would have had a very strange look. Lord Coleridge presiding. This was something that was going to be done in the full glare of the Lord Chief Justice's court in the Strand. Uh, the heir to the throne sat next to Lord Coleridge on the bench. Edward would remain on the bench throughout. Here he was well placed to influence proceedings and undermine Gordon Cumming. From the contemporary sketches, he has a rather amused expression on his face as he's sitting on the bench, um, knowing that he's the center of the way about what's going on. Uh, the jury would be in approximately this position and looking straight across at the Prince of Wales as they heard every bit of evidence. Uh, the jurors would have been surprised and in awe uh, of the heir to the throne being within feet of them. When he was asked his opinion, Edward didn't hesitate. The juror stood up and asked the Prince of Wales, what was your Royal Highness's opinion at the time as to the charges made against Sir William Gordon Cumming? And the Prince of Wales turned to his side to, to face the juror. The charges appeared to be so unanimous that it was the proper course. No other course was open to me than to believe them. The case was now effectively closed. The jury's verdict went against Gordon Cumming. Plainly, their verdict had been affected by the Prince of Wales's evidence. Gordon Cumming faced social death. Edward's dignity had been wounded, but not fatally. 
the whole Trambic scandal um, affected him tremendously because again here he was in court and to the world revealed the fact that there he was gambling for money. It seemed to underline what his mother had all along been saying, that he simply, that he was feckless, that he lived for pleasure, that he was indiscreet. And it was sobering and coming late in life when he really, people thought he should have been too old to be leading that kind of life anymore. It, it did have a certain effect on him, definitely. After Tranby Croft, Edward finally graduated from adolescence into adulthood, just in the nick of time. Well, by the 1890s, he's 50. He is aware that his mother being in her 70s can't go on forever. And I think what we see changing in him is the knowledge that he could any day uh, wake up and find that he is king, which is perhaps something he hadn't felt 10 or 15 years earlier. And I think to an extent he kept slightly more careful company after that. A sign of Edward's maturity was his new mistress, a society lady, Alice Keppel. Like her direct descendant, Camilla Parker Bowles, Alice would become the long-term companion of the Prince of Wales. She was, like all these mistresses, a very um, beautiful woman, a very um, well-dressed woman, the kind of voluptuous sort of woman that, that he liked. The relationship is different from the early women. She was nobody's fool, Alice Keppel, and she knew how to handle him. She knew how to handle his very, very short temper. As he got older, so he became more uh, short-tempered, more gruff, and she... <laughs>
His father had to thrash him for that. Because of his willfulness, his stubbornness, his... Uh, ...sad and anxious about him. He is so idle and weak. It was one thing to say that he ought to be an example to his future subjects, but to say that he should be exactly like his father was too demanding. And the parents therefore left him with a sort of perpetual sense of failure. A rare break from this misery came in 1855. The 14-year-old Prince of Wales went with his parents on a state visit to the court of the Emperor and Empress of France. Now, they were exactly the kind of people that suited the temperament of the young Prince of Wales, was unlike his own parents. They lived for pleasure, they loved clothes, they loved excitement, they loved balls, they loved dances. This simply set his, his pulses racing. And he was clearly gobsmacked. He was a 